Hello, and welcome to Discovering True Health, your weekly deep dive into health and wellness. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our upcoming shows. You can also check out additional information on our website, Instagram, and Facebook. All those links are below. Now, a study in the 90s done by Kaiser was one of the largest investigations into how childhood trauma affects later in life health and well-being. Now, the study found that people who experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences have an increased risk of seven out of the 10 leading causes of death in the U.S. They're more likely to develop adult diseases like cancer, chronic lung disease, and liver disease. Also, on average, an individual with four or more adverse childhood experiences has a life expectancy of 20 years shorter than someone with no adverse childhood experiences. Now, childhood uh, adverse childhood experiences also affect the way our DNA is read and transcribed. And epigenetics is, a, an emergency, is an emerging area of scientific research that shows how children's experiences, including trauma, actually affect the expression of their genes that can majorly affect their development and health and well-being later in life. Now, it's estimated that 90% of life is controlled by epigenetics. And with that being said, most, most doctors today are not trained in screening or in treatment in a specific area. So today on Discovering True Health, we're going to discuss how childhood trauma can affect epigenetic changes that alter the physical structure of DNA and affect the childhood development and how this in turn negatively affects our health and well-being as an adult. We'll also be discussing how epigenetic changes and effects of trauma can be intergenerationally passed on through the epigenetic mechanism. But the good news is that the negative uh, the negative epigenetic changes are reversible and treatable, and we will be discussing prevention and treatment as well. So I have a panel of guests joining me today to discuss this very important topic. I have Dr. Vivian Ariola. She's a licensed psychologist with a degree in clinical psychology, and she specializes in early childhood trauma, PTSD, mood disorders, and addiction. I also have Dr. Clayton Bostock. He is a naturopathic physician, and in his work, uh, he approaches his work in, with inter an integration of naturopathic and functional medicine. And I also have Ravi Sahai. He is an author and speaker, and he speaks and writes on the principles of Ayurveda and ways to reduce our health care costs and improve our well-being. So thank you all so much for joining me today. Pleasure to be here. Now I love to now I love to start with getting a good understanding of what epigenetics is. So, Dr. Bostock, can you kind of give us a good understanding of what the science of epigenetics is and how does it differ from our past understanding of our genes, behavior, and function? And can you kind of give us an overview of the function and behavior of DNA versus the epigenome so we can get a basic understanding of the two. Yeah, I mean, in just in basic terms, if you think of uh, basically genes as blueprints, right? And they code for essentially when it comes down to it, just proteins that basically make up, uh, you know, what we are as humans. Um, but uh, yeah, the hu human genome, I think it's about 20 to 25,000 genes. Um, those genes are made up of uh, DNA and essentially, um, again, as I mentioned before, the, the code for different proteins, basically the building blocks of our body. But um, it doesn't mean that uh, those, all those 20,000 genes are on at one time. There's different um, triggers in the environment um, that basically regulate those. And it, when you said the word epigenome, well, that's basically your machinery that uh, kind of like, plays the piano, so to speak, that turns genes on and off. Um, an example of that is literally uh, like methylation is something involved in turning genes on and off. And I literally earlier today, I did a big dose of give myself a big shot in the butt of um, methylfolate and methylcobalamin. And that's um, something that 
does right that's part of that machinery that turns genes on and off but um yeah typically the conductor of that is your environment so that's your diet that's where you live that's the people you hang around with that can be the things the topic of this show childhood well not just childhood trauma trauma in general um stressors whole bunch of different things like kind of outside of you and inside of you that uh, regulate how that how those genes are essentially played how that piano is played uh, um and the epigenome is yeah kind of the machinery that um dictates what genes are expressed at different times fascinating so it's not it's the way we used to think of genes was everything was fixed, but now this with epigenetics, we're now understanding that there's this another another layer to it that is actually, um, you know, they can be influenced and turned on or, on or off. Yeah, I think that's been in the last say, 20 to 30 years where that's become more um, under the microscope, especially more in the last 15 years or so. But um, yeah, it's like it, to give you an example is this is something I like to share on my social media quite frequently. I've shared this post a number of times, but <clears throat> you could have let's 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 take 50 people and all of them have the diagnosis of whatever can whatever non-genetic condition you want to say. So let's just say they have Sjogren syndrome um, and they all have the same label. But uh, they're, they're all going to have, if, if you see enough people, somebody with the same label, they all have a little bit different symptoms. Yes, they fall in that box of what Sjogren syndrome is, but um, they all have a little bit different symptom picture. They may have other conditions with that, but because of epigenetics married to their genetics, um, one case of Sjogren's isn't going to be the exact same across that board of 50 people. And that's the interaction of genetics epigenetics and the environment that produces that. So uh, conditions like that, that's one thing about medicine is they're not all just one thing. Like it's, yes, in a textbook it is, but when you see a person in real life, it's not just one thing, right? Right, and that, that makes a lot of sense. So that's why I guess there's no one size fits all to medicine. It, it depends how your genes actually react to medications as well as the environment. Exactly. Fascinating. Yeah. Now, Dr. Ariola, I'd love to start with hearing from you on this one. You specialize in childhood trauma, and you talk about how trauma can even begin in utero. So in terms of genetics, how can childhood trauma cause changes in the genes? You know, what are some of the physiological and psychological changes that can take place? And what are some of the factors also that can affect the epigenome? So uh, fetal exposure to a mother's stressors is incredibly important, important uh, in utero. Um, when a mother is exposed to trauma, from PTSD, anxiety, or depression, anything very stressful, this is passed out to the baby. Um, what we tend to see there are complications in reduced growth in the timing of tissue development. Uh, and this changes and impacts the architecture of the baby's um, developing brain, which can cause neurodevelopmental disorders. And this results in impaired functioning. We see lower birth weight, we see pain with this. Um, there's a decline in cognitive and motor function, which a little later on, you know, when they're toddlers, when they come alive, and you have to start working with like an occupation therapist, do that quite a bit to get their motor functioning. Um, there's also can be some speech delay um, that's pretty significant there too. There's also an increased risk of miscarriage for the mom um, with hypertension attached to that and fetal growth retardation and postnatal developmental delays between zero and five. And there have been many studies that have shown psychological impact to these babies with moms that are suffering. Um, you can see anything from emotional reactivity, emotional dysregulation, uh, ADHD, conduct disorder, impaired cognitive development. And one thing that I saw very often when I was working uh, with this population, and I was an advocate for the school board system uh, in Northern Florida, uh, the diagnosis ADHD was being slapped on every kid. It's very overly used. 
And I would go into the classrooms and worked with the guidance counselors to teach them about the overlaps between trauma and ADHD. And there's quite a bit of symptoms there. Um, cortisol is the stress hormone that's impacting all the complications I just mentioned. But cortisol is also uh, very useful because it is important for freeing stored energy that helps us for flight or flee when necessary. Too much of it can lead to disease, depression, and also increase susceptibility to infection. Right, and you also talk about nature versus nurture. And I've seen some of these studies, what they've done with rats and identical twins, um, which, you know, I guess identical twins would have similar DNA, but then they've seen, you know, with their environment um, differences. Mm, and this is fascinating. So there was a groundbreaking, groundbreaking research um, called the Minnesota Landmark. Uh, this was done a while back. They, it's a longitudinal study. So they studied um, twins that were separated for a course of about almost 20 years. And there were 137 set of twins, 81 were identical and uh, 56 were fraternal. So they did find that certain genetic behaviors influenced by their environments. And this would have been sexual orientation, which was more prevalent in male twins and female twins. I find that really interesting. Religious views and social attitudes, which we could kind of understand and um, suppose there, but um, yeah. So basically nature versus nurture, you have like your genetic components, but as Dr. Bostock was saying, um, you have certain uh, epigenetics married to your DNA, DNA structure and it's gonna be different for different people. Right, and, and I, in doing my research for the show, I also read a study that was done with rats and they were saying that mother rats spending a lot of time licking, grooming and nursing their pups. Um, some, you know, some had that behavior while others kind of just ignored their pups and the highly nurtured rat pups tended to grow up to be calm adult little rats while the rat pups that were you know received little nurturing tended to grow up to be anxious so that's kind of they were talking about that was the difference between you know genetic and epigenetic the calm versus the anxious and the nurturing behavior of the mother during the first couple of weeks of their lives you know kind of tended to affect the adult rats as they grew up. Yes, I saw that. Thank you. Um, and then there's the young brains developing in formative years. So basically our brains develop about 90% by the time we reach kindergarten. That's amazing. Um, so this is really important for genetic, um, epigenetic adaptation that influences these gene releases, if when they're going to release the structures and how, and these are responsible for uh, promoting certain like life skills, um, mental health sets, and like things like constructs like grit and resiliency. And you learn that through um, your environment really. Um, this period is crucial in providing supportive and nurturing experiences, similarly to what you were saying about the rats. And this is why uh, the Head Start programs and a lot of um, early childhood programs throughout the country that really target the underserved populations because we tend to see a lot more trauma. It's much more prevalent there because of low socioeconomic status, but they have wonderful efficacy rates. Um, because they provide the mother, family, and children with loving, supportive environments to, to learn and grow. Fascinating. Now, Dr. Bostock and Ravi, do you have anything to add to, um, you know, how childhood trauma can cause negative effects in the genes? We can start with you, Dr. Bostock. I don't have anything specific childhood trauma um, or examples to, to add to that, but... Um... I can talk about uh, like just trauma and, and trauma specifically. Um, I think it was, I can't remember what the study was, but in the uh, Confederate war, US Confederate war, um, I believe, okay, so prisoners of war who were in like just prisoner camps, obviously there was a lot, basically you think of a uh, prisoner of war camp, terrible conditions. I think there's a lot of famine, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And I, 
I believe what they found with the, like this was passed down to a generation, right? This is transgenerational epigenetics, they called, they call it, but um, the sons of soldiers who were prisoners of war, they compared them to the sons who were captured. And I think it was like a, something like 10, 11, 12% higher mortality rate. And these sons had um, just a higher propensity for cerebral hemorrhage, hemorrhage um, so ble bleeding in the brain, essentially stroke. And then I think oh, di different types of cancers when compared to the sons of these um, basically prisoner, or sorry, the sons of these soldiers who weren't prisoners. And then the other thing was the, the, the question that was brought up was it's like, okay, well, you know, did this chain, did this get transferred genetically or epigenetically, or was it because these sons had fathers who'd been through, you know, um, war imprisonment and they were just, they came home from the war and they were just terrible fathers who, you know, were abusive, et cetera. Um, but what they found, I mean, that could have been a possibility. I don't think that was actually snuffed out, but the sons who were born from these same men previous to the war didn't have the same rate of mortality or the same issues with the cerebral hemorrhage and the cancers. So um, yeah, not totally cut and dry there, but an interesting thing. And I think there are similar things in um, Scandinavian villages, kind of, you know, northern areas, if there was issues with the fishery and there was uh, food supply issues, kind of similar things that they saw in, um, you know, offspring of those people uh, who went through that type of condition. Not that that's necessarily, that particularly is, is a trauma, you could think of it that way, but some type of um, stressor on, you know, on, on the person that got transferred down the, down the epigenetic kind of line, if you will. Right. That makes sense. And maybe going back to what Vivienne was saying about the cortisol that, you know, kind of stressors causing changes in that, which could change oh, yeah. epigenetics. Do you, and speaking of intergenerationally passed on effects of trauma, do you have any other information as far as how that transfer can happen epigenetically what they found was that i think it was in sperm cells was that certain genes um actually this was a different study but it, this, this was more about um certain genes related to the senses um around that area like this was this one was was a mouse study where they trained these mice to be scared of a certain scent right and when it whenever they the scent was put in the cage they shot them Okay, and then the offspring after that, um, whenever they smelled the scent, they got frightened, their, their stress hormones went up. So um, what they found in that case was that the sperm cells had uh, a change in the gene that was around scent, olf olfactory um, function. I'm not, back to the, the prisoner of war stuff, I don't know how, you know, how they would identify those issues, but changes in yeah, really different metabolic functions, I would think. Fascinating. It was and cancers and, and hemorrhage, right? Wow. And that, that's why it's so important to understand this, that it can be intergenerationally passed along, that we need to kind of pause and figure out how we can heal our trauma so that doesn't mm -hmm. happen. Um, yeah. Now, Ravi, uh, in, your, in our previous conversation, when you were on my show, you spoke about the wisdom of epigenetics and how it's been part of... Um, the science of Ayurveda, which is the oldest healing science known to man that originated over 5,000 years ago in India, you know, and yet this understanding is fairly new to Western medicine and science. So can you speak on the importance of epigenetics and childhood trauma being a root cause of disease and the importance of why current, our current medical system um, needs to focus more on addressing it? Uh, thank you. This is um, a question that has come to me later in my life. Uh, for personal reasons and the very, very important health cost reasons. So uh, we talked about nature versus nurture and Eastern perspective, which Ayurveda, and they have Sanskrit word for it, which is Prakriti, which is nature, and Vikriti, which is the nurture. So 5,000 years ago, they, they 
knew about this and uh, they have given answers and simple ones and we'll talk about that. But let us look at where we are as a healthcare system and we have functional medicine, naturopathic doctor and uh, you know, psycho clinical psychotherapists here. What has happened is the genome study has run out of steam because there's a lot of hope that, oh, the genome will give us the, all the personal medicine and genes will map to diseases. That didn't happen. And that was as recent as 2000. 1998, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study came, which you talked about by Kaiser and CDC. And in last 25 years, it has become more and more important. And that is still itself fascinating. <laughs> Number two is epigenetics means beyond genetics. So when genome you know, kind of faltered, I would say, epigenetics, as Dr. Balls Bostock said, you know, it started to get prominence. Epigenetics is about nurture epigenetics about lifestyle. And these things are very, very empowering because it's something we can control. The other, we can say, wow, you know, what can I do with it? I have this gene, but epigenetics is very, very empowering. And I want to quickly add that in 2007, microbiome and gut brain access research came, which is just mind boggling because it is in touch with what Ayurveda said. And so here I am admiring our Western development and how it has come closer to that Eastern wisdom. And one thing I would like to quickly add along those lines is that trauma affects autonomous nervous system. That is what the Western medicine is finding. And polyvagal theory, by Dr. Stephen Porges is the theory which explains how our nervous system gets stuck, especially when the child's brain is very, very malleable. It could happen even in embryo, but definitely it happens in the first three years of life. So we are on a very, very important topic and I'm sure we'll explore it more. Absolutely. Together. Thank you for sharing that. And that's what's so fascinating to me is that this, you know, the oldest science in the world already had this kind of embedded in it. And it's, you know, it's, it's important. And I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Now, the epigenetic mechanism can help to explain the lasting effects of childhood trauma, like you were just speaking about. And I mentioned at the top of the show how childhood trauma events can increase the risk of disease and even shorten lifespan by 20 years. So how does adverse childhood experiences and trauma affect our health and development as an adult? Um, we can, I guess, start with Dr. Ariola and then Dr. Bostock and then Ravi can um, comment. Well, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, neuro, the neurodevelopmental disorders and all the emotional dysregulation and um, impaired cognitive development that's occurring. Um, the chronic illness that's attached to that is um, poor immune functioning and also poor cardiovascular health. Now, with that said, I'll speak on the psychological component, um, my department, but there's obviously various negative effects here and consequences. So the usual that you can imagine, anxiety, depression, externalized aggression. Then there's a lot of instability, instability in relationships, interpersonal skills, instability in employment. There's an increased rate of unemployment in those. Um, then we see something that we can imagine is the increased um, use of alcohol and drug use, right? So they self-medicate and as one can imagine, um, a lot of them tend to repeat abusive relationships and imagine that. So you're repeating the same traumatic, abusive environment that you grew up in at a very subconscious level, even though you think you wanna have healthy relationships 
in the future. You, we tend to, you know, Freud talked a lot about that, um, the irony of repetition. And 20 years later, you're in an abusive relationship and you're dating or married to your mother or your father, whoever that was, or maybe a combination of both. And I have a lot of my clients trying to work through that. Um, as we talked in another show, so during my um, hypnosis sessions, and I've been doing a lot of past life regression therapy, all you see there are, you know, trauma bonds and um, people trying to work through their pain and suffering with their parents. And then we go deeper and it's like whatever their parents went through, I always try to make it a point to understand whatever information historically that they know about their maternal side and their paternal side and where they're from, if they're from a war zone, different part of the world, um, did they have abusive parents? Was there neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse? I mean, you usually can detect it pretty quickly. Um, and when you're working with moms, which I did that for a couple of years, the moms that were suffering from their own trauma, either in early childhood or later on in life, and you know, some of them were victims of domestic violence or a whole gamut. Um, they're incapable. Well. It's not that they're incapable, I guess it's, they're very challenged in connecting emotionally with their baby, mm -hmm. understandably so. And so that's what I would come in, I would step in and I would work on that relationship, but we first would have to unpack and I'd hold space for their own abuse that usually they didn't work through until that moment. And then what happens is they have this unbelievable guilt because mm -hmm. they cannot connect to their baby the way they had hoped. So that gets packed on, and that just creates further anxiety and depression, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Um, so it's really important that um, we try to mitigate, you know, these negative environments later on in life, and I'm sure we'll get to that a little bit later. So, yeah, no, thanks for sharing that, and and what what you just described makes so much sense in how this can become cyclical and just get passed on as well with the environment and the nurturing part from mother to child, um, which is why it's so important that we, like you said, kind of heal, heal that before the next generation comes along. Um, Dr. Bostock, do you wanna add anything on the physiological level of how trauma you know, can affect our health and development as an adult? Yeah, I mean, just, um... I mean, obviously, uh, related to trauma is a huge component of stress, right? How we talked about um, how the autonomic nervous system can just get stuck in fight or flight response, right? And uh, if you think about it, well, basically, just from my observations or almost any observations, a lot of times people notice just stress will worsen anything, like any type of medical condition, for the most part, stress can worsen it, right? Um, and like from a physiological standpoint, if you want to go there, it's like, well, your body only has a certain, like a finite amount of resources, right? And all of those uh, complex systems that your body's made up of, well, they require a certain amount. And if you think of like the pie charts, they require a certain percentage of the energy that you have, the finite energy resources you have to run efficiently. So if you think strictly from an energy perspective, well, you know, being stressed all the time, that takes up a lot of resources, mental, like just even just the mental chatter, the thinking, the obsessing about things, or, um, yeah, I mean, just doesn't really matter what type of stress it is, it's going to require a response from your body to uh, deal with it. And that takes resources while chronic stress over and over and over and over again, that's going to start chipping away at that energy kind of pie diagram, whatever you want to call it. And then there's less, uh, um, there's less basically energy to go around to all those systems. Uh, and usually what you find is that um, more, more uh, like earlier or later evolved systems, like, uh, like how complex our sent, well, not so much our central nervous system, but more later evolved systems or systems that require way more energy, like the central nervous system, cardiovascular system, um, they start to get less energy and then they don't function as well. So that's a lot of times you can explain symptoms because that system is just 
energy inefficient. Well, what's one of the most common things we see is like depression, anxiety nowadays, right? Um, that's oversimplifying it, saying it's just an energy problem. But um, yeah, I mean, just to give you an analogy, it's like, okay, congestive heart, heart failure, that heart is getting bigger bigger things some a lot of times in nature are less efficient so you think of stars that are getting bigger and then they basically die out right or you think of um you can think of it as in this terms an obese person is energy inefficient right and generally you put them on say say they're hypo they're obese because they're hypothyroid when you put them on some thyroid medication they become more energy efficient and then they lose weight right so um yeah, I mean, just developing, having less life expectancy is literally, you could just, I know I'm grasping at straws here, but you could tie it to that they've gone through so much stress consistently, they're less energy efficient, and then they can just literally develop diseases, you know, faster or age faster than the average person who's just doesn't have as much stress or trauma in their history, so... That makes a lot of sense. And and thinking of it in terms of bandwidth, like you were talking about, makes so much sense. Exactly. I mean, I've experienced that myself when I went through a chronic illness and you feel like your bandwidth is so limited and, mm -hmm. you know, and your body does, yeah, you need energy. And if you're burning, you know, with your brain cycling about, you know, depression or, or, you know, you're going through a traumatic experience, you're burning a lot of energy your body needs to use elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, Ravi, do you have anything you'd like to add as well as far as how childhood experiences and trauma can affect our health and development as an adult? In fact, um, yeah, both of them have covered it uh, quite well. But uh, one thing I wanted to link together, that this cortisol and the stress connection, again, is a new thing in the Western medicine. Before, like heart disease was because of blood pressure, but they didn't say, oh, blood pressure is because of chronic stress or cortisol is the inflammatory marker for all inflammation, whether you go to a cardiologist or an arthritic uh, doctor or whatever. So that's one thing that is unifying, I want to point out, cortisol, which is connected to stress. And uh, as Dr. Bostock and uh, Ariel, Dr. Ariel pointed out, the nervous system is the one that can get stuck and then it is in hypervigilance mode, et cetera. So that chronic stress is happening because of some experience. And that is going back to the, you know, where the leak is coming from rather than doing a Band-Aid approach, right? But it is not easy because everybody has to be involved here. And we talked about the role of mother in the embryo in the first three years and, uh, the one thing that on trauma, the best book I read was a classic book, Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman. That's book in 1980s. And the later book is uh, The Body Keeps the Score by Vessel Van de Kerk. They, they both are psychiatrists of high repute. Now, one of the adverse childhood experiences is child sexual abuse. And that trauma is very, very difficult and it takes a lot of time. And we have more data on that. But my point is we need awareness as a community so that as you said, these kind of trauma which human beings can control we, we need it to, for our future generations. So your, your topic here uh, is you know, very, very commendable. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing those books too. And I'll post those below because the more, more we can all learn, the better. Um, now, the good news is that you know, the negative epigenetic changes are reversible because of the nature of epigenetics. You know, this is treatable, this is beatable. And, you know, like you just mentioned, Ravi, you know, we need to really take a look at this problem and acknowledge that this is real um, and it's happening. It's something we need to, you know, put more focus on and more attention on. So what would be some possible solutions, modalities, or therapies to kind of assist in healing the negative um, physiological and psychological effects 
and negative changes to the genome because of childhood trauma. So I kind of love just um, with all three of you kind of brainstorm what types of shifts in healthcare are needed and what types of things to focus on in order to kind of help heal this and help in this healing process. Um, we can start with Dr. Uh, ladies first, Dr. Ariola, and then Dr. Bostock, and then Ravi. <clears throat> Well, that truly is a, a silver lining. It's extremely hopeful to know that there is a degree of control on our part, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, and knowing that it's not written in stone, you know, whatever has happened to reverse, you know, being a survivor of polycomplex trauma, you know, I work on it uh, on a daily basis. Um, and I have to say that the best practice overall is the obvious loving, supportive relationships and environments, minimizing stress. It's all the things that I, everybody already knows, um, but it positively correlates with lowered stress. You know, we saw a lot of a rat race right before COVID. And I think as tragic and awful of an experience it was to collectively go through COVID all around the world, I think there were some silver linings there. A couple of them were people were given a little bit more freedom to work from home because we had no choice, some of us, right? Um, most of us. And people started realizing, hey, you know, I can be as productive. I don't have to like get ready, go in, drop the kid off, you know, go to work, you know, the gas, the pollution, we spend more money and you can work from home or, you know, you can travel and work, which a lot of people were doing too. Um, I think, well, I, I know that a lot of people started implementing a lot more meditation, which was wonderful. Um, I could clearly see the clients that I was working with during that, the ones that, you know, got on board with meditating with me during a session and then trying to implement the practice at home and the ones that weren't, I mean, there was like a stark difference. Um, and I could just see certain clients, you know, their mental health was just declining and declining and they were alone. They didn't have a good support system. And that's another thing we need good support systems. Um, exercise, I mean, all the things that we know we need to do to stay healthy because all of these things circle back to a reduction in stress. And that's the killer, as Mr. Sahe was saying. Um, it's all about, you know, now everything's being linked in, but, you know, Eastern philosophies have known about this for so many years, and it's really been wonderful um, to see it a lot more accepted, a lot of uh, more awareness in the Western culture. We need it. I am, a, as you know, Christy, I am a firm believer of Western science. I'm a scientist, but you know what an advocate I am, and I'm just like a wholehearted believer of Eastern practices, medicines, way of life. So I think the integration is very, very powerful. And unfortunately, I will say, because you mentioned something that I thought was key here, you know, what we would need to do to uh, in our healthcare system. Well, having to deal with insurances, <laughs> let's start there. Because, I mean, I, I don't want to get into too much here, but I'm sure all of you have experience and those watching, you know, insurances don't want to pay for this. They don't want to pay for that. They're telling you what's allowed, what's not. They don't know. They're not listening to the healthcare providers that are, have expertise in this. A lot of things aren't accepted. And, you know, people are resorting to different things now, different things that are taboo or maybe more taboo or being a lot. Um, more highly respected, like plant medicines, past life regression therapy, things over the subconscious. Um, it's not solely about what your insurance company says you have to do. And a lot of times things are getting approved and you're wasting all this time. You're calling different numbers. There's a, there's a fight that's causing so much stress to the poor person that's dealing with cancer or terminal illness. And it's just like this vicious cycle. So what do we do about that? Because I'm at a loss there. I, I, everything's so expensive. Um, that, I mean, I think that's a good starting point. Maybe you tell me what to do on board, but something's got to change. No, you're absolutely right. It's, it's unfortunately turned into such a business and, and it's not, um, you know, we've, we've really got to focus more on the prevention and, you know, and, and recognize that trauma 
the effects of trauma and childhood trauma are real and they are many times the root cause of many of these diseases later in life. So if we can, you know, kind of shift our medical system to focusing on that and focusing on mitigation and, and that, I mean, that's, that's a key area for sure. Um, Dr. Bostock, do you have anything to add along those lines? And just clarify the question. Yeah, so um, some possible solutions, modalities, therapies to kind of assist in healing this, um, you know, the, the changes to the ge genome that have happened because of childhood trauma or trauma. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to echo everything Dr. Ariola said. Um, that's dealing with trauma certainly isn't like my wheelhouse or my expertise. Um, yeah, so in terms of my modalities, um, again, not my expertise, but the big picture I would say is, um, I know this is overly simplistic, but I, I think the big picture is like, it's essentially it's kind of a cop out, but it's like, it's the system, societal system we have set up here. I'll just get like, even just a small example of, um, you know, when I've been in Europe and like just, uh, Germany, France, Holland, over to Greece. I uh, haven't been to any Eastern European countries, but sp <laughs> spending time over there, and then I'm I'm in Canada, uh, and then just just seeing like how people live their lives there. A little bit more pedestrian cities. Uh, they seem to be just more conscious, happy people. At least that's what I observed. <laughs> Respect food more. Um, just with the pedestrian setup of the cities, it's like you walk around and people are going out to dinner. It's good quality food. Um, of course they have, you know, fast food chains and stuff over there as well. Um, but they, they seem to respect alcohol more. It's not just crushing beers because we're watching a football game. We're going to get completely kind of like the U S college football kind of scene, you know what I mean? Or the U S college scene. Um, yes, there are some people that probably obviously overindulge in alcohol over there, but there seems to be more respect for it. Um, and just the big thing is you go out at night and like, you know, the people are more social, you, you, you're walking around like around apartment blocks and people are out on the street, like just talking to each other. You don't look inside and there's a 60 inch big screen TV and there's 10 people huddled around with it, you know, crushing pizza. Right. So I don't know when I, when I've come back from Europe and I got back to Canada, I was just like, and I don't live in a huge center. The town that I live in is about 100,000 people. And I was just like, I remember getting back here and for a couple of days, I was just like, like, what are we doing here? Like, it felt like the rat race here. Obviously people over there are busy too. I'm, I know they have stressors in their lives, but um, yeah, I think especially in the West, US, Canada, it's kind of like the, the, the proverbial rat race. Um, and it just, I'll wrap this up here, but uh, Michael Moore made a movie, I think it's quite a few years old now, maybe 10 years old, it's called Where Should We Invade Next? And what basically what he does is he goes around to different European countries um, and basically kind of finds like some of the things that, you know, we should invade this country for this aspect of their lifestyle or their social system or whatever. But it's like he interviews these people and it's just, it's just less insanity how their societies are run. And I think that's a big component of, um, you know, stressing people out the way that we structure our society here. It stresses people out, stressed out people can cause trauma for other people. Um, so yeah, I mean, just if you want me to go to the root, that's at least a big portion of the problem is the, the crazy society we have here. Yeah, you're so right. And, and, you know, I've traveled a lot too. And when you're talking about Europe, I was like, I mean, they, the mentality there is they work to live and here we live to work. So it's, it's just very, you know, very different. They, you know, they have these long extended months of vacation where everybody in Europe takes, I think it's a month off, you know, yeah. that's, that's the culture. Um, so it, they're just it, happier people there, I find. Yeah. And for, from hearing from, I sense. hearing from both the doc, from you doctors, it sounds like, so this, let's say we go through this childhood trauma and it affects our genome and it's, you know, I guess switches on or off genes and we have this negative effect that can for later on cause can't, like a disease. But it sounds like by just changing our environment in the moment, 
it's not that we necessarily have to go back and, you know, go back in time or, or figure out how to heal something specific. It's changing in the moment we can just switch, you know, make that change or, or heal that depending on our atmosphere surroundings or our, you know, stress levels. And it's your mindset. Right. It's huge. Mindset. So it's basically, we have the power in the moment to kind of, you know, depending on our environment and. Yeah, Dr. Joe just And that's again, a very, very profound question. And uh, the question is what to do and how long will it take, right? Mm -hmm. so, so again, if you look at the Eastern wisdom of first awareness, and then in that awareness, healing can happen. So yoga and meditation, those things, two things have been talked about, especially in trauma recovery. I mean, past life regression is another interesting subject, but just staying in today, as you said, once we become aware that something has happened and we are storing it in our body, trauma is that, okay? Now, how do we solve it? Now we have, you know, tomorrow is, or day after tomorrow is Mother's Day. And I have been hearing that, oh, I didn't have good mother. And somebody says I had very good mother. How do you deal with that? That's a trauma that is stored in the body, right? And I have very high, I mean, of all relationships, mothers is the best, you know, because, uh, so I would say we, we miss parenting big time in 60s. Why? Because we are not given the right knowledge that love is what is only needed, not all these boundaries and formulas and all that kind of thing. Because the Bowlby's theory of attachment, which says that the child builds the bond with the safe environment. And the safe environment is nothing more than rocking your baby in your arm. And it has all the intelligence. But now let us say we have become adult, we got deprived of it. But still, as you said, we have that awareness, which is the healer, which is the most powerful healer. We call it energy healing. And yes, how that awareness happens, how it comes into the body, whether it comes as a medicine or a massage, but that is the beauty. So. Yes, we all have been traumatized. And now we have to say, yes, we have this empowering message. We can get in touch with ourselves, with self-care, with self-love, so that then we can love others. And yes, this will be a dance. There will be Prakriti and Vikriti and, you know, will be, but then we'll be dancing with some resilience. And that is the resilience we are all looking for. And yes, America is very stressful because we are a little bit more materialistic. Uh, we think that if I get this much in dollars, it will be better. But, uh, but reality is that there are other metrics for happiness and, uh, or, or a vacation. And many times we take a vacation to recover from another vacation. So we have to kind of, you know, as uh, the belief system, we have to also uh, kind of, calibrate. But, uh, but America gives the freedom to ask these questions that we are asking. ACE's study happened in America. It didn't happen in Europe, though it's or, or in India. But so, so we have to say, you know, we have, we have right kind of equipment too, plus your podcast to raise that awareness. Absolutely. So as far as, so you were talking about Ravi about how, you know, we, you know, some of us had, you know, trauma from our family or trauma from our mother, and then we have these stored traumas. So what would be some of the modalities to help kind of, you know, shift these things, you know, at that point so we can heal ourselves? Yes. So, so you know, forgiveness is a big, big part of it, uh, which is not easy to come. And the fact is that the person who, both, you know, I mean, mother bears the child for nine months and goes through a lot of sacrifice. So it is not just like, you know, saying, oh, this incident's happened and so I don't have a good mother. The, the point is the awareness has to come to a level 
that we are all connected, we all have problem, can we forgive, can we love more? And when we don't love ourselves, we can't love others. And these are the, it, uh, these are the something that we have to learn also. And I'm not talking uh, in a narcissistic sense. I'm talking about, you know, having a good self-esteem so that we can be compassionate. Uh, so so uh, again, you know, these are all about introspection, about raising our consciousness, raising our energy. But the fact that we are talking about it, talking also is a therapeutic. It heals. We say, oh, others are in similar difficulty or something. Now, America is very individualistic. So community is needed for healing also. You need people who can listen to you. They may be too busy, but the point is we have to build community and we have to build our immunity so that we don't get attacked by viruses or by somebody, you know, kind of not thinking high of us. So we have to build immunity and we have to build community. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you all for joining me today. This was absolutely wonderful. Do any of you have any final kind of thoughts on preventative measures that we haven't spoken about? We can start with Dr. Ariola. Um, just a few words here. Thank wellness, think holistic paradigm, and you view yourself as a whole. And there's so much yes to what Mr. Sahay just said. I mean, I was hanging on every word, yes to everything that you just mentioned. We are a sum of all of our parts and it's, you know, forgiveness is key without that. And I mean, I struggle with that at times with my clients because who am I to tell someone you need to forgive? I mean, everybody has to arrive in their own time. But if you're going to hang on to all that anger and resentment and all that toxic energy, that's just eating away at you at a very deep level. And we need to forgive so that we can love. And, you know, you mentioned compassion, um, you know, get help, seek help, whatever that is. You know, if you want to go the Eastern route, the Western route and an integrative route, um, but community is huge. Yes, so much yes to that. Um, it's about human connection. At the end of the day, we're all here for that human connection and the purpose, our purpose and meaning in this lifetime right now. So all that, you know, the rat race, we all talk about the consumer, you know, everything that you, everybody's just like working so hard. And I, I have to say again, back to COVID as horrible as it has been with all the lives that we lost something very important happened there. You know, you saw a shift of people just like quitting their jobs, changing careers, doing things they never did because they started realizing like people were dying at a very fast rate. And so what's the purpose of it all? For me to just wake up every morning, be a robot, go to the office, it, that, that that's not living. And you mentioned that, Christy, it's about living, right? Like we have to join in on the land of the living. I heard that song this morning on a bike ride and all I did was like look up at the sky and I was smiling and singing and it's like the land of the living. Yes, like we have to appreciate every moment that we have here. Obviously we don't know when our last breath will be, but we need to, we need to release, we need to forgive and we need to live and find joy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and would you say that unforgiveness and carrying around this resentment is that something that can affect us epigenetically? Oh, of course. Because we're kind of creating a negative environment in our bodies. You're spewing in that. And it's deep in your subconscious where all that trauma is stored, right? We're talking about like uh, Dr. Bostak was talking about like stored energy and you just, it's, it's just festering and festering. It's just like growing. Even if you think you have it like under control, that will follow you. That is your shadow. That will follow you in life until you're ready to face it head on. And that's why a lot of these um, plant medicines have been so successful. People claiming, you know, like one night with ayahuasca, it was like 20 years of therapy because you sit with yourself and everything is right in front of you. Um, you don't have to go that route. It can be something a little bit more traditional, but I think it's more about the awareness and the courage to face yourself. Because at the end of the day, what can be so scary? It's you. You're a child of your higher power if you believe in one. Like it, it can't be that bad. You have to just have the courage 
to sit with yourself and just kind of go through things one by one with help. And if you don't want to hire help, you know, maybe it's with a loved one, it's your partner, a, a close friend. It can even be a stranger at times. You can have like really deep, meaningful conversations with people you'll never see again. Um, and it's just about a level of vulnerability, I think is needed to be able to look at it head on and then let it go. But like Mr. Sahay said, it, sometimes these traumas take a really long time. It's not just gonna go away. It's been building for years. Um, you know, it's, you have to keep your eye on the target and make it um, very intentional. Beautiful. Uh, Dr. Bostock, any final words regarding preventative measures that would kind of help mitigate these long-term effects of childhood trauma? Honestly, I, like, I, I think these guys covered it really well. I don't have a whole lot more to, to add to that. Um, yeah, some really, really good um, suggestions from obviously different angles, right? A bunch of different angles. So don't have a whole lot more to add. Uh, Ravi, do you have anything to add as far as preventative measures and final words? Uh, again, I I, uh, I would uh, commend for the panel and you for doing this. It's very, very important. It's more important for America, not because more trauma happens here, because America is more individualistic society. And that awareness is not there. And they need to be empowered with love and caring is that's the community part. And they need to have that awareness that yes, epigenetics is their friend. Lifestyle can help them lead out of this rut. And that is why I am very, very hopeful about the Eastern message coming to America. America has more yoga teachers than, than New Delhi has. I mean, San Diego has more uh, yoga teachers than New Delhi has. So, so what we have to do is do trauma-informed care. And I agree that insurance is totally archaic. It, it is totally broken. And that is our challenge also, that how do we create functional medicine? That functional medicine world to me means something is dysfunctional, you see? And, and yes, it is. So, so first thing is uh, empowerment to ourselves and taking care of young children. Young children, they are our resource. They are the future of the country. They need all the love and care more than anything else. And that is what the message is from Bowlby's theory of attachment, from the polyvagal theory of Dr. Stephen Porges, and all the work of ACEs and epigenetics and finally microbiome. So this awareness we can do, pharmas are not doing it because they are looking for a pill. The answer is not in the pill. The answer is in empowering ourselves and raising our awareness. So thanks again. Beautiful, you said. Now I will post links to all your websites and contacts and information below, as well as some of the books that Ravi mentioned that are amazing to do some ex more extensive research on the topic, um, as well as a ton of other great um, resources and links. You can all dive deeper into epigenetics. Um, so thank you all so much for joining me today. You know, the long-term effects of childhood trauma is such an important topic that we all really need to understand more. And like you were all saying, the message here is because of the nature of epigenetics, we have the power to heal it and change it. It's not set in stone or stuck in stone. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you all coming on. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very, very much. Remember, knowledge is power. The more you understand about your body, the better you're able to stay healthy and prevent disease. And a reminder, I'm not your doctor, so please don't take this as medical advice. If you have specific questions about your health care, feel free to reach out to your practitioner. And if you like this video, please like and share it with others. This information could really help someone you may know. And hit that subscribe button and the little bell to be sure you don't miss out on future shows. 
and join us next Wednesday for the next episode of Discovering True Hope. Hope.